Uh, let's introduce ourselves starting to my left. Charlene Douglas, Mayor Pro Tem. Mike Fanier, Fournier, Mayor of Royal Oak. Ann Vara. Tim Twain, Community Development Director. Ann Beakey. Doug Hedges, City Planner. Dave Gillum, City Attorney. Thank you. Um, item B is the approval of minutes from July 9th, 2019. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. <laughs> I wasn't here. Moved by Ms. Douglas. Second. Is there support? Support by the mayor. Is there any discussion on these minutes? Not seeing all of the favor say aye. 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 Minutes have been approved. On to public comment on non agenda items. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to make a public comment on anything not on the agenda? Okay, not seeing, I'm gonna close that public comment and I'm gonna move on to item D under other business. This is a sign variance. It's a request to install wall signs and menu boards while maintaining non-conforming freestanding sign with electronic message center for fast food, drive through restaurant, McDonald's at 3300 Rochester Road, Mr. Twain. Um, you do have the staff report in front of you. Uh, that outlines uh, the details of the request. Um, items A, B, and C are related to wall signs that are proposed uh, at this uh, location. Uh, items D, E, and F are related to the menu boards that are proposed. And then items G, H, and I are related to the existing freestanding sign and existing uh, electronic message center. Um, as you can see in the report, they are proposing to put uh, two wall signs on the, uh, I the west and south facades. Just make sure. Yes, west and south facades. Um, one of them on the south side is uh, the, the logo uh, for McDonald's, the arches. Uh, that, that particular uh, logo is... Uh, looking at 14 square feet. And then the uh, word McDonald's is at 32.8 square feet. Both of those are under the total of 100 square feet, but since they're proposing two distinct signs, uh, they are requesting uh, permission to have two wall signs on that side. Very similar on the west side, uh, they're proposing another uh, Golden Arches uh, logo. Again, it's at 14 square feet. The second wall sign is a, a welcome sign that's, uh, I believe, slightly less than uh, three square feet. It does project out from the uh, a building because it's mounted on a canopy or awning. Uh, and so that's the uh, uh, other variance, uh, item C, uh, that they're requesting uh, projects out some three feet. Those are the ones that are related to the uh, wall signs that are being proposed. In terms of the menu boards, uh, they are proposing to have four uh, menu boards, two of which are labeled as pre-sell menu boards, and two that are related are labeled as uh, menu boards. Um, the, the sign ordinance only permits uh, one menu board per drive-through window. Uh, there is only one drive-through window at this location, although there are two paths uh, uh, in terms of vehicle travel. Um, so that's the first item, item D, regarding the menu board. Second item in regards to these is item E. Uh, they're proposing that the uh, menu boards be taller than the allowed amount of uh, six, a total of six feet. Uh, so there's the item E. Uh, and then the uh, item F is in regards to Electronic Message Center. Uh, they're proposing that that cover 100% of the uh, uh, menu board area, uh, and it's only allowed at 50% uh, of that, uh, as well as the as aspect ratio is not being uh, complied with. Those are the proposed signs for uh, the menu board. Uh, the others relate to the existing freestanding uh, sign that's uh, located on site. Uh, as you can see in the packet, it is uh, nine feet taller than what's allowed in uh, sign area two. And then the uh, square footage of the electronic message center on that uh, uh, freestanding sign exceeds the uh, maximum amount, as <coughs> does the 
total square footage of the uh, freestanding sign itself. Uh, that's kind of an overview of their request. Uh, if there's questions, I'd be happy to address them. Thank you, Mr. Twing. Any questions for Mr. Twing? Okay, not seeing is the petitioner here? Name, please. Uh, Patrick Stieber. Would you like to expand on? Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, we're here again tonight for another McDonald's. It's another uh, remodel project in the city of Royal Oak at another McDonald's store. Um, basically, uh, you know, as was stated, we're here asking for a few few different variances. Uh, first of all, being the wall signage, um, what we're proposing uh, is basically the standard signs that we've been proposing and installing at all these McDonald's locations, uh, just like some of the ones at the other locations in Royal Oak. Uh, this building does front two major thoroughfares. There's major traffic throw, uh, flows on both of these roads. So getting branding uh, and on both of these elevations from both of these roads is very important. Uh, there is a definite hardship, a lack of identification, uh, not having these signs uh, for people to see, you know, the McDonald's branding on the building. Um, basically, again, uh, you can see what's being proposed. Uh, these signs are much smaller than what's currently was at this store before the remodel began. The total square footage of signage that we are asking for is, is much less than uh, what the code actually allows. You can look at the elevations and, and kind of just see how these signs kind of fit within the architecture of the building. Uh, they are small in size and are designed to fit well uh, proportionately with, with how these buildings are designed. So you can see the, uh, the arch logos and the McDonald's letters set on the front and the additional logo on the side. And these welcome letters, again, we, we feel are more directory type, you know, just here's the entrance. Uh, you know, it's, it, is, it is on the canopy and does project, but it's, it's stationary up on top of there. It's a very lightweight sign uh, made of foam material. Um, basically, that's the gist of what we're proposing on the building. Uh, you know, like I said, very similar to, the, to what you see at the other stores that have been done. Uh, in regards to drive-through signage, uh, again, these are menu board informational type signs. Uh, we're not trying to get traffic in from the roads here. We're trying to get traffic flows through the drive-through here. Um, as you know, McDonald's does do a double drive-through. Uh, they do 75% of their business through their drive-throughs. Getting people through these drive-throughs quickly and safely is a very important thing. Uh, having these menu boards uh, so that people can quickly see what they're going to order uh, is very important to getting the traffic flows through. Uh, again, these menu boards are, are exactly uh, what's been proposed at the other stores, nothing different. They are, according to code, you know, electronic message centers, but really it's just a digital menu board. Um, not, it's not out there to attract attention messaging to the to the general public driving down the road um, so we just want to make sure you know that that's understood and that's what the intent is just to get the information to the drive-through customers so that they can just get through the drive-through um, I'm sure some of you have been to McDonald's and seen some of these drive-through lines and it's definitely an important thing um, Size-wise, you know, they are a little bit taller uh, than what's allowed, uh, but it's, you know, uh, from past experience in Royal Oak, uh, it's been pretty common for uh, variances to be approved uh, for a little bit larger menu boards in height due to this same type of circumstance, you know, getting the information out there so that they can get people through these drive throughs um, so as part of the submittal and working with the building department, due to the fact that they do have this existing road sign, they said that we needed to include that into the review so that everybody could understand the full extent of the signage at the site. 
So I'm sure you guys have all been by the site. There's currently an existing double-sided road sign there uh, that the plan is and has always been to just keep that sign in place. Uh, definitely don't want to lose that sign. Um, it's been there for a long time. Um, don't feel that there's any detrimental effects to keeping that sign because it's been there for so long and you know everybody uh, has seen the sign there, knows the signs there. Um, there are some hardships to you know, making that conform, it's a very tight corner. Uh, there's some visibility issues if you bring the sign down. So we real, really feel like keeping that sign will not have any detrimental effects uh, due to the fact that we are, in fact, decreasing the overall size of total signage on the site as an overall. Um, we're really hoping that you can see the hardship that we have there. Um, you know, like I said, you, you are all aware of, you know, the, the busyness of this intersection there. The traffic flows from both directions on Rochester Road and 13 Mile Road. So the signage that we're proposing is, is definitely in our eyes needed. Um, we do feel like there's definite hardships and uniqueness to this property. So we're here tonight to get your feedback and, and, and hopefully uh, be able to work together to, to get these signs approved. Thank you. Any questions for the petitioner? Ms. Douglas. What is the role of a, what do you call it, a pre-menu board? Why do you need those? Well, again, it's a, it's a, it's a tool uh, for the drive-through. So when you're sitting there, there's a, the order menu board, and then there's the pre-menu board, which will be a pre-menu so that people have time to actually look at items on that prior to ordering. So then when they get up to the order screen, they can actually have a better idea and maybe quick, more quickly make their decision in ordering. Um, but it's a, it's a pretty common practice uh, for all drive-throughs, not just McDonald's. Um, you see this with a, a lot of fast food drive-through stuff. Uh, it's all about getting the information to the, cu the customers so that they can quickly get through that drive-through. So, so is it like a menu? Or is it a try our new chicken sandwich? It can be either in this case, yes. It'll, there might be some uh, specials on there. Uh, Andrew, the owner's here. He could attest to some of that stuff. But, uh, you know, the, the, the strategy here with the new digital ones is a little bit different from the static ones. So they are able to, you know, change that for breakfast, lunch, menus. Um, but uh, having items on there with pricing is definitely what they're trying to do. And so, again, so it is a, a, a precursor of the actual ordering menu. Sure, absolutely, yep. And it's not just a sales thing. Um, it can do both. I mean, I'm not gonna, the, the, the board is capable of putting like, for, for instance, you know, they can do shamrock shakes at that time. Maybe they'll show a picture of it with the price on it. But in this case, it has the ability to have multiple things on multiple order items on it. Uh, you know, moving these things to digital technology is, is definitely a good thing uh, to be able to get these, this information out to the customers. Uh, okay, thanks. Ms. Beakey. Um, you stated that people sit a long time in the cars and that that's part of the goal is to get people to move through quickly. And at the same time, um, we're striving to be a more walkable, accessible community and protect our environment and air quality, which people sitting in cars is not necessarily ideal. What have you done to try to help have people get out of the cars and actually order inside rather than staying at the national standard of sitting in the car to mitigate this need for these extra signs? Well, people are, are I understand the area here and the environment, but people are going to always be on the move. They're going to be driving. There's no doubt about it. Um, the inside is, is busy as well, and uh, like I said, Andrew is here. He can attest to, to some of that, uh, how busy things are on the inside as well. I know when I pull in, if it's that busy, I'm pulling in and I'm going to try to go in if it's quicker, you know. But as far as what McDonald's corporate is doing about that, I, I can't answer to that. I, I don't know if there's anything that they're doing to try to make things more foot traffic friendly. What other locations in Royal Oak have the same signs? You stated that other McDonald's do. Uh, yep. Um, well, the Royal Oak store on 11 Mile uh, is a recent one that was done. Um, 
the other one on Coolidge, correct? That's a rebuild, yes. Yep. And the last question is, on the, on the sign that's currently existing, the old sign that's at the edge of the parking lot, are you stating that, I understand it's being reviewed because it's part of this review because of all the other signs, are you saying that there's going to be no changes to that whatsoever? Correct. The plan is to, to keep utilizing that current As sign. As is. Yep. Okay. I have a question from um, Mr. Twing. So I'm looking at the current McDonald's, and there's a red-backed sign with McDonald's in white, and then there's a the M uh, already, and then there's also another M below it with McDonald's with brown backing. So how many signs would that be considered that they have now? Is that three? I don't know. I don't have their plan. It could have been, could be they treated it as one, but. So this has been here a long time, though. Right. right. Okay. I'm just, because it seems like they're decreasing, at least on this side. This is the south side. And then there's also a portion of the signs that has <coughs> McDonald's written five times in, like, um, embossed red. I'm wondering if that would be even a, like a fourth or fifth sign. How would they? How would the building department count that? You know, I, I, I don't know, and I, I don't really want to speculate on how something I don't have in front of me. Okay, but that th is this what it's existing now? Is the red back sign? Correct. So you that, haven't made any changes. All that okay. stuff on the building is gone. It's that's not going to be there. It's, oh, it's gone. It's yeah. We'll all, go. Yeah, it's already gone. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. So, like, like we said, it, we've eliminated. I mean, there were signs on three sides of that building, much larger signs. You know, we've we've definitely what's being proposed is is much more tasteful. Well, it seems there's going to be less, and in in, in in terms of the south side, at least, I haven't made my way around the building with Google yet. But okay, and then the pole sign that's there now. You d you're not taking that down. You want to just keep it. That's it. And no changes to that. Correct. And it's all. It's, so and that is 25 feet tall right now. Correct. Okay. Have you considered cutting that down to 16 feet? Well, the, the problem there is, like I stated, is is by lowering that sign, you're going to lose the visibility under clearance sight lines. Okay. Because when you move the sign down, there's going to be less area to see from between between the bottom of the sign and the ground. So cars there on that corner, it will create possible issues of people not seeing pedestrians and things of that nature. Okay. Especially for across the street from Oak Ridge. There's a lot of kids that come across that. So. Okay. Any other questions for the petitioner? Okay, not seeing any. Um, this is not a public hearing, so it's back to the commission for discussion and a possible motion. Sorry, my computer's locked up. Would you like to use mine? Oh, yeah, just pull up. Yeah, thanks. And look at it there. Thank you. Told you to go on those websites. <laughs> so on the north side of the building, they had three M's, a red backing, and then a white McDonald's. And, it, and also the, the M by the drive through behind the silver van had, um, it was another sign that had McDonald's over the M. So that would be... Five, maybe? I, I don't know how oh, they're counting them. Okay. Oh, so, Douglas, I'm sorry. so my thinking is, just off the top of my head, looking for feedback from my fellow commissioners, um, I'm okay with A and B and C. We've encountered this before, where somebody has an awning and there's a sign on the awning. It uh, inevitably it sticks out from the wall. Mm -hmm. um, where am I here? Um, I'm, uh, I mean, I see the need for, if you've got two pathways, lanes, you need a sign for each lane. That makes perfect sense, like an ordering sign to me. Um, I'm interested in feedback from my fellow commissioners on those two, you know, promotional things before that. Um, I'm 
fine with the five and one e five and one eighths inches um, di uh, difference. Um, I'm gonna skip F for a minute. Um, the the big news is, and you're not gonna like this, is that I'm gonna ask that we bring your pole sign down to the allowed height. Um, we've done this elsewhere around the city. As, as I've said many times, we only get one bite of the apple. If we leave this 25-foot sign there, it's going to be there for another, whatever, 10 or 15 years. Um, we've, we did this to the Burger King on Main Arby's. Street. Um, Arby's. We did it to Arby's. Yep. Um, and on Woodward, and that's a main, main thoroughfare there, too. Right. Um, so I'm going to be asking that the, the pole sign comply with all of the elements of the ordinance. Um, so that leaves kind of feedback from my fellow commissioners on this whole aspect ratio, 100% of electronic message board covering the sign. Um, thoughts? I'll, uh, yeah, I'll just comment at least my sense on item D uh, for the menu boards. I do see, I mean, this is on a corner. It can be a busy corner. And, um, you know, if the menu board does help save you know, six seconds every transaction, especially during peak times of lunch and dinner, then is there a benefit to the community as far as not having, like, the Starbucks situation that we have where, you know, cars get backed up and, you know, even if you, you know, are waiting three or four cars, I think that there is a, a um, some public benefit here by allowing this on this busy corner. The question I have about the height, though, and I don't know how to best, I mean, the petitioner made a point. I don't know how to validate it. Uh, the height of the sign, like with Burger King and Arby's, um, those weren't on the corner of intersections. Mm. So you didn't have the outs and ins like you have here. And I don't know if it does or does not block the view of a driver. I guess it would be hard for me to visualize that or validate that, you know, without actually seeing the sign itself lowered and then say, oh, no, now raise it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Um, so I don't know what that modeling looks like or if our, um, you know, Mr. Twing has any ideas on it. But, um, you know, that would be my one. I mean, yes, I agree with you in general. We want to pop them down. But if the what the petitioner says is, is true, you know, that gives me pause. Um, and I think, yeah, that's the only two comments I have at this point. A uh, question for Mr. Twing. Is this a an area that um, ha has a lot of traffic in terms of semi-trucks? Do you know? I don't have a count there, on is, it. Is there any load-bearing uh, restrictions for semis? No, Rochester Road's obviously a major road. Uh, okay. So mm -hmm. I think you're on a corner with major roads. You're going to have semis on both, but I don't have counts. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts? I, I guess I, I'm wondering why the, the electronic signs, I can't understand the idea of the efficiency. Again, I would like to see more things looking up, up getting people out of their cars because I think that's a, that's a problem for pollution issues, um, which is not on this uh, point. But why can't the signs be a little bit smaller, even if the 100% ratio, because they're both oversized and... non-compliant with the size, in addition to being four signs instead of one, which I guess that's kind of a question for him rather than here. Is that H and I that you're referring to? Oh, question? sorry, I'm looking at the picture. Um, yeah, the signs that are for the driveway, for the drive through You mean the secondary menu boards? The first and the second, if I was understanding the information correctly, they're both fully digital, which is non-compliant, but as well as being larger, and I'm just wondering why they couldn't be a little smaller just to comply with at least the size. The actual sign yeah. size yeah. or the message? Okay. If I'm understanding that correctly. Um, it's a good question. Or it has to do with yeah. the height yeah. of the yeah. Can you, um, there now. It, are, the, uh, are, are you asking to waive 95 square feet? It says from a 42 square foot freestanding sign area. Is that the messaging board? No. Or over square what, footage. What she's referring to are the menu boards. Correct. Okay. Oh, yeah, those I'm are, talking about the menu are, boards. Those are items D, E, and F, um, and there's not a square footage number there. It's oh. too tall. It's 100% okay. 
electronic message center versus uh, 50 percent. And H and I are the is that H the poll G sign? G H and I are the poll sign. Ah, I see. Yeah, I'm talking about D E and F. Sorry, okay. I was on a different page. Okay. Well, I would think too, and maybe you know, from a environmental perspective, if people are still going to go to the drive-through anyways, you know, if they're there longer, they're burning more fuel longer. You know, so the throughput does help them. You know, it's not better. It's not. It's not as good as parking and going into the store, but um, you know, there is a benefit if, if traffic flows faster, a little bit. Right, especially if they're not on the street side. I'm not quite understanding them. If they're in the parking lot, and I understand people are in line, the four signs I'm not having a problem with. I'm talking now about the size, and the differentiation. I mean, if it could be, if they could be smaller. They are smaller. They're smaller than the existing signs that were there. They are? Oh, yeah. Smaller. Much smaller. How many well, existing there, signs are there now? Well, they're all ripped out now, but there was were. The, How the, same, were the, same, the same four. Oh, four too, uh, many too many words to pre-sell. Okay. But the new design, the, the, these signs that are being proposed are 30% smaller than what was there. Just the digital area is bigger. Well, because of the kind of new well, sign the, it is. The whole thing is digital, you know, and, and yeah. I think that that's something, the, the code kind of really hasn't addressed the the digital portion of for menu boards you know mm -hmm. i think that that more reads to if you're putting a message center out on a road sign and because this sign is digital we still have to come here because of that you know there's two different intents between those two signs so when we say when when they write it up like this i think it's because they have to because the way the code is written yeah, because the it's the same purpose. It's essentially the same as a static sign. Maybe. Exactly. They just don't have to manually change it. Don't have to manually change it. Yeah, you know. but it's electronic and it's illuminated, and that you know, triggers the. For, from our standpoint, it looks ten times better, and we're trying to eliminate the use of plastic in all the restaurants. So this eliminates all of them little stupid or the little signs that you see everywhere. So you don't have to put those up pre sales. So you don't have any other kind of signage blocking your landscaping. There's no plastic. These are all LED. You know, they're, they're really, they're pretty sweet. They're super expensive. That's why he's here, but, you know, they are, <laughs> they are a good thing. So. Any other discussion? Is there a motion? I defer to people with more sign experience. <laughs> Uh, all right, I'll try. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a motion to um, approve the following elements of the proposal. Um, to approve a two wall signs on the west front facade, b two wall signs on the south side facade, c allowing projecting sign. Four, D, allowing the four menu boards. E, waiving the height limit. F, allowing the electronic message centers to cover 100% of the... Um, but I'm going to say no to G, H, and I, and with the, the objective being to bring that poll sign uh, into compliance. Is there support? I support. Support by Ms. Beakey. Is there a discussion on this? I'd like to comment with the GH and I if that sign were um, updated, that it also be modernized to fit the new aesthetic, if possible. Don't you think it would be? I don't know. I'm just saying. I, I don't even know if it has to be in the notes. I'm just commenting because oh. you asked for comments. So if Any other if discussion on this motion? Um, Mayor? Yeah, I guess I would ask um, Mr. Twing, in the event that this does create a traffic hazard, how would we, will it, I mean, I, I guess I can't ask you that question because you're not, I mean, I'm just trying to get through that hat. You know, we're, we're here, we're, we want to make, I mean, and I agree in concept and in principle that these signs should you know, Commissioner uh, Douglas is absolutely right. We should, you know, take every bite of the apple when, when these things come up to make sure they comply uh, to avoid, you know, all the sign litter and everything like that in our community. However, uh, this is on a corner. It's a busy corner. There are, um, 
the the requirements that we have account for that some of these signs could be on a corner and therefore our requirements are fine for the field of view and everything like that well if if they have to mon or if you don't grant the variances for they're going to have to submit a revised plan for what the sign would look like and as part of that submission I believe the building office would look at is it impacting site clearance corners site clearance triangles is it impacting anything on that design so they would they would what they'd have to propose is a, a new sign at this location that showed compliance and they would review it based on whether it's creating any issues so they could come back if in fact it did create these issues if if, if they have to comply the with the sign ordinance building would have to determine there are no issues in order to issue a permit for it only at the point was there another issue would you see it again for some sort of waiver so if they submitted a freestanding sign that was 16 feet high 42 square feet in area and so on they'd just issue them a permit if it was proper if it was placed. Right. okay so there's still another check gate here right. that if they go and this gets approved the sign comes in and building will say hey you right. know the one that planning just approved yeah, you're creates not approving a hazard the sign you're not approving no we're not approving the sign but they'll have to put forward another application for one that does meet our requirements and from there the building department would determine if there were clearance issues or whatever and then they could very well come back and say hey we got to go back to the original one or however that process works okay so there is a check gate there to make sure that if that is truly an issue we, we have the ability to remedy it okay any other discussion? I'm going to be supporting this motion. I think it's a good motion, and I'd like to see the sign shortened. I understand the corner issue. I, I, I really do, but people that travel this corner are very, very, I think, accustomed to seeing this there. The McDonald's brand is extremely recognizable. You've got some, going to have some, a new building, new signage on the south and the north sides. You're still going to have a sign out front. Um, we're not sure what it'll look like, but those golden arches are um, certainly recognizable. And my question about the semi trucks, I don't know that there's enough high traffic that would preclude a, a, a vision of, of seeing that. I, I, I mean, I can't think of any vehicles other than a semi that would block or a box truck that would block a view. So, and it would just be for a few seconds until the light turns. So. That's why I asked that question. Any other discussion? Let's call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, next is another sign variance, SV190811. This is a request to install roof signs for automobile dealership Victory Motors at 517 North Main Street. Um, with the variance to allow installation of a prohibited sign type, a roof sign, on east front and south side facade elevations. Mr. Twing. Um, you've kind of outlined the request um, in the sense they are requesting two prohibited signs. In terms of uh, wall signs, they are compliant uh, in terms of size, uh, square footage, uh, those items for sign area two. The issue that's before you is whether you'd permit a variance to allow them to go above the roof line, uh, which would, which treats them as a, uh, a roof sign, which are prohibited in all districts. Um, that's really the, the question before you. Any questions for Mr. Twing? Looking at the picture, I'm, oh, thank you. Sorry. Looking at the picture, I'm wondering, is this the sign? This is the sign. This is the picture of what the roof sign would be right. on that part. Okay. But I just want to make sure that that's what I'm under. Okay. Thank you. Here. Welcome. Your name, please. Uh, my name is Ed Phillips, Phillips Sign and Lighting, okay. 40920 Executive Drive, Harrison Township. Go. Okay. Uh, here this evening representing uh, Victory Motors at 517 North Main Street, Royal Oak. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our hardship is an old building construction with a very low decker roof and a building setback. When heading south, our building is extremely challenging to see with the home on the north side of us. We probably share that property line. I'm sure we're not on it, but we're so close, you, you really don't see our building back there, unless you're 
looking. Further complicating our situation is we are 100 feet back from the center line of Maine. Uh, we are in the process of modernizing our building with a brand new facade that's presently under construction. It will look just like the drawings you have in front of you. Uh, per the Royal Oak sign ordinance, it's already been mentioned, but uh, we are allowed 100 square foot in sign area two, that's the area that we're in, for a grand total of 200. Uh, consider we're only asking for 22 and a half square feet on the east elevation, and we're only asking for 14 and a quarter on the south for a grand total of 36 and three quarters square feet. Uh, our intent when we began this modernization of our old building was to build something very attractive with some strong design elements, yet simple and clean. And I think we did a good job. I think this building looks sharp for you know, what, it, what it is and what it will be. We feel our signage is, albeit minimal, placed where we have it on the building, accomplishes all of our goals. So your approval here tonight would uh, be much appreciated. We could continue with the construction and get her done. Uh, I might also add that if you look up roof sign uh, in the dictionary, a roof sign is, uh, you may have heard this before, but a roof is a roof and a facade is a facade. These really aren't roof signs, they're facade signs placed on a building. If they were on the roof, we'd be building like we used to in the old days. We built all those steel racks and we hung signs on the racks. Those were truly roof signs. This is not a roof. Thank you. Just a statement. Any questions for the petitioner? Is there a motion? Looking at me? Why are you looking at me? <laughs> Why me? Sorry, I'm having computer problems. All right here. Uh, I can't find the exact language or the reference, but I would move to grant the variance. Is there support? Support. Support. Uh, mo motion by Ms. Douglas, support by the mayor. Is there any discussion? I'll just comment that I agree that in the visual, I understand that to be on the wall of the slightly higher wall, and so. I agree with the motion. I'll just, well, just for clarity, oh. the definition of a roof sign is anything above the roof, um, and this is clearly above the roof line. Um, so that's the definition that's in the sign ordinance. So it does meet the definition of a roof sign. Thank you, Mr. Twain. Mayor, did you? No, I'm good. Okay. If there's nothing else, let's call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you very much. Okay, on to item three. This is a proposed zoning ordinance text amendments. We have A and A, B, and a C. Uh, uh, hold on a second. Oops. Mr. Twain, do you know the login password? Thank you. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, the first one is permeable pavement for parking lots and driveways. Mr. Twing, do you want to well, this was, um, see this up for us? This was in front of you at a prior meeting. You had some discussion about uh, uh, not the actual draft language, but the, the concept of, of uh, permeable pavement and, and, and other items related to that. What staff has put together for you um, is some proposed language uh, to address definitions, and then also a couple of the sections in the zoning ordinance in regards to uh, broadening the uh, clarity as to what is meant by uh, acceptable surfaces for parking and uh, driveways and other things. You'll see that uh, under Article uh, uh, 77109. Uh, the definitions are, are listed in... Uh, 77-8, seven, seven and again, they're proposed. The changes are highlighted in yellow. Uh, the language that is in uh, uh, just simple uh, black type is the existing language. Uh, and then we've also uh, suggested some language uh, that dealt with uh, potentially allowing uh, uh, two-track driveways at residential uh, with some uh, 
types of uh, uh, material in, in between the, the various tracks. So this is draft language uh, that staff's looking for your uh, input on and concurrence. If you're acceptable with it or you see some revisions you'd like, if you give us those directions this evening, uh, our intent would be to schedule this for the required public hearing, hold that hearing, and at that time uh, you'd get input from whoever. Um, and then you would, after the public hearing, uh, uh, give a recommendation to the city commission as to whether uh, you would recommend those amendments or not. Uh, I don't know, Doug, if you want to add anything to it, but uh, that's no, basically no, this, uh, this item that's in front of you tonight. Uh, you'll see a little portion that's in red, uh, you know, whether or not uh, six or eight feet uh, with uh, grass sod or reinforced turf, uh, what's acceptable uh, to the commission uh, from staff standpoint, either of those, and either of that wording is fine from our standpoint, it's just we didn't pick one. Um, so um, with that, I think that's the overview I will give you. I think we've uh, talked about this last month a little bit. Thank you, Mr. Twain. Question on the six to eight feet. Um, I'm looking at this. We're saying for driveways with a width of 10 feet or less. So if you went eight feet, you could potentially have a track that's a foot wide and a foot wide. Right. And I'm trying to think of a car. It's a pretty wide car uh, to go eight Humvee. feet. Humvee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And I feel like you, with the eight foot one, you might not be driving on the, might not be driving on the track, creating right. another set of aesthetic issues. But just a quick thought. Yeah. I'm sorry, Ms. Well, Douglas. but it does say the center portion of no more than six or eight feet. So the center portion could be narrower than that. The tracks yeah. could be tighter in. Yeah. So I suppose if you together. had a large car and you wanted to do a two track. Well, and I'm, I'm quite certain that there are driveway builders out there that have, you know, that know the standards and know how to create a driveway like that that will accommodate most vehicles. Yeah, the average car is like six feet, six and a half feet. Yeah. Um, okay, so loose aggregate, like a crushed limestone or something like that would be prohibited as this is written or... That's our intent. That's okay. the, what we gave you last uh, last time, and what we've discussed from a okay. staff standpoint is not to allow um, loose aggregates, gravel, stone, or unreinforced items uh, uh, as approved parking materials. Okay. <clears throat> I have a question about that. So that would be. Thank oh, thank you. Uh, so that would be a new standard because some driveways currently have gravel, but that the idea is not to have the debris going into the street? Well, it's not permitted now. Um, but if they're, if they're old houses, they must be grandfathered in or something? Correct. Okay. That's not permitted on new construction? Okay. So this is adding the permeable features. Okay. So, Ms. Douglas. So I'm, I'm just picturing a house that has a, a driveway, and you certainly don't want ag loose aggregate in the driveway down by the road because then it washes into the um, uh, sewers. But what if, you know, next to the garage or by the garage, you've got a parking area, which is never going to get anywhere near a sewer. Um, uh, why wouldn't we want to allow aggregate in those circumstances, Mr. Twain? I think it's more of a, a maintenance issue. Um, someone that might take care of their yard is 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 fine, but uh, if if you allowed it uh, uh, all over, I think it becomes similar to other maintenance issues on a piece of property that uh, we get complaints about. Uh, versus um, if you put in a, a hard surface that's reinforced or you've got grass that's interlocking. I think we've broadened your ability to use um, other materials than concrete and asphalt um, and still do that without it just being unkept gravel. 
So is the definition of driveway the approach to the house <coughs> heading back to the permanent parked area, whether it be a garage or not? Is that the definition of a driveway? Because you can have a parking pad that's not a driveway. So what I think what Ms. Douglas might Anything that's parked on would, would be required to meet these criteria. So okay. if you were parked yeah. an RV in your backyard, you'd have to... Because you're still saying off-street lot parking. Okay. Off-street. Even if it's not the driveway per se, if you're putting a car on it, it's off-street parking. So the one really natural option that um, that people would have would be the interlocking uh, uh, the pavers that grass can go Reinfor go through. Reinforce grass inside, yeah. Right. So those grass, you can have grass pavers. Yeah. yeah, you could put those down. But nothing like pea gravel or anything like that. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't here for the discussion last month, but to me... Again, especially in places where there'd be parking off-site, isn't it infinitely, I mean, much more permeable to have? I saw someone's house. It's a very large house I walked by yesterday, and there's a parking pad that is filled with decorative rocks. Clearly, they only use it some of the time. To per prohibit that completely seems like it's, I mean, causing people to use a lot more non-permeable surface, even when they might already have, this is a house, for example, that had two driveways, two parking places, a garage, and then a parking pad next to it, which clearly they must use for guests or something. But it was well within the confines of their property, the grass. It wasn't anywhere near the driveway. But that just causes people to pave in a lot, it sounds like to me. I don't know if all off-street parking has to be that kind of non-permeable. Well, I would add, I would add, and again, uh, if you allowed loose stone, it doesn't necessarily mean it's permeable because we'll loose stone, in. depending on the soil material, can pack it down and water's not going to seep through it. Um, it. So I wouldn't I wouldn't make the broad statement that just because you're allowing gravel that you're going to get a permeable or pervious surface there. It, it can pack it down. So it, I mean, if you look at some gravel yep. roads, there isn't any water seeping into them. Um, they're all running off. So it, when you really are talking about a, a true permeable, uh, you have to look at does it really soak into the ground. And while we're allowing some reinforced turf on a residential property, there's no engineering going into it. So I don't know that you could really say that the water is going to soak through it. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a perception, but it still may not do so. But it's still depending a, on the material that's under it. It's still it's another clay, more, right? So. Yeah, that is true. If it's clay, it could just you know pull into the driveway and go down. Uh, but it also <laughs> is a shot at something that may be a little bit more decorative, a little bit lower cost, and a little bit more environmentally friendly. Right. And and again, we're we're suggesting that it be in some fashion that it's contained, reinforced in the sense of not letting it just spread everywhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So are you looking for? I, I'm looking if you if you have no objections, we'll schedule it for a public hearing at the, your next planning commission meeting and. Do, do you need a provide motion? Provide notice. Mr. Um, I guess if you're happy with it, that would be helpful to say that direct staff to uh, schedule a public hearing at your September meeting. Do you need any feedback on the red items here, though? Well, if you, you wanted to make hearing? comment, I what I heard was. Eight feet may be too broad, but um. well, I don't know. Maybe uh, you know. I guess uh, if you have a bigger truck, you know what I mean. Like if you you have a work van or something, maybe you want a broader one, a bigger one. And but I, I don't need a def an answer tonight. You could make okay. that decision after the public hearing. Well, there you go. Mm -hmm. And then grass or sod or reinforced turf. It could be all of those as well. So if someone's planning on coming out and speaking at the public hearing, you could say surface with grass. was well, not grass and sod. Maybe I'm not the smartest. But grass or sod and reinforced turf or reinforced turf could also be the a potential as well, right? Right. Okay. So 
So yes, to answer your question, I think it'd be clean to have a motion to direct staff to schedule for a public hearing. I guess one more quick question. So on 1B, when it says hard surface as required, the impervious and the pervious would both be potential uses, and you'd prefer not to have the gravel loose gravel. But the, obviously the other permeable options is the whole point of this, correct? To, have, to add them as an option. Right, the definitions are adding it, and we're we're allowing more than. Okay. If if this gets adopted by the mm -hmm. commission, we're going to broaden what's allowed to happen. Okay. Thank Is there you. a motion? I Mayor, move, I move that we schedule a public hearing. Is there support? I support. Support by Ms. Beaky. Any discussion? Seeing all those in favor, say aye. 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 Moves to a public hearing. Next item B is lot size, density, and off street parking for multiple family dwellings. Mr. Twain. Uh, this is really more of a report. Um, the commission, planning commission, has asked staff to look at multifamily dwellings, densities, and others. Uh, there's no particular uh, draft zoning language to go along with this. Uh, Doug has spent a lot of time putting this together, so I ask him to come and uh, kind of give you the data behind it, the highlights to it, and then if you want to have some general discussion about various items um, and whether you want to direct staff to address certain items of this. What we did look at were lot size, the density requirements, as well as off-street parking for, for multifamily. Uh, with that, I'll let Doug kind of walk through the, the, the highlights, uh, and then you can ask questions. Well, what we did first was come up with two sets of data um, for uh, multiple family sites within the city. Uh, the dividing point being the year 2002, which was when the uh, most recent version of the zoning ordinance and our current density standards were adopted. So we created lists of all sites that were built prior to 2002, and then those that have been either built or approved by the city since then. Uh, we recorded what their, uh, the size of these properties, uh, how many units were on the property, uh, to try to calculate their density in acres per unit, and also how many off-street parking spaces each had. Our intent was to see how many of the sites uh, those built prior to 2002 and those built since then could comply with our current density standards and our current uh, off-street parking standards. Uh, the first one for lot size and density, uh, without reading the formula out, our current density for multiple, maximum density for multiple family project is uh, comes to 13.5 dwelling units per acre. Uh, we then compared that to all the properties, that multiple family properties we have in the city. Uh, we, there are 224 known properties in the city that were built prior to 2002 with multiple family dwellings. Of those, 213 or 95% cannot meet the density standard we have. Um, <laughs> Of uh, the 45 sites that have been either approved or built since 2002, 42 of them are 93% exceed the maximum permitted density. Uh, of those 42, 17 were specifically approved with higher densities by the city through either a plan unit development or a conditional zoning agreement. Uh, so the city actually agreed to you know, allow them a higher density than what our, our current ordinance uh, permits. We also looked at the uh, two-family residential zoning district uh, that has a minimum lot size of 9,000 square feet for each duplex. Uh, we found there are 204 properties in the city under two-family zoning. Of those, only 46 or 22 and a half percent can meet the minimum lot size. Uh, the vast majority of them are under 9,000 square feet which is the current maximum uh, density for two-family residential. Uh, what we then did was try to play around with some different numbers by modifying the minimum density formula uh, to see 
potentially how could we make more of these sites conforming and how can we get to a density standard that's more in line with uh, what the city's been approving either through you know the recent planning developments or conditional zoning uh, applications that we've seen uh, we have the table in there in the report that shows you know what would happen as far as how many are not conforming uh, if we reduce the, the minimum lot size formula by by varying amounts uh, we also looked at the off-street parking for multiple family uh, properties within the city um, there's not much to report on those built since 2002 uh, to, as to how many of them comply with the minimum requirement of two spaces per unit. Uh, most of them built since then do comply. Uh, of the 54 uh, multiple family projects approved or built since 2002, uh, only 13 of them don't have two spaces per unit. So most of them that have been built um, since 2002 comply on the other hand the same is not true for those sites built <coughs> prior to 2002 uh, of those 224 sites 175 or 78 percent do not have two spaces per unit uh, further 135 of those sites or 61 percent even have fewer than one and a half uh, spaces per unit so uh, the parking disparity falls more upon the sites built prior to 2002 than uh, those built since then. However, in the report, we do spell out that uh, most of the uh, recent projects that with multiple family dwellings that have been seen by the Planning Commission in the form of conditional uh, rezonings or planning developments uh, have been providing less than two spaces per unit, uh, more around one and a half to 1.3. Uh, spaces per unit uh, we provided links to all of the uh, the data sets we compiled uh, there's also maps in the report uh, we have links to other maps in there that kind of shows how we came about uh, the numbers that we compiled uh, we try to summarize at the end of the report that you know here are a list of items we could look at possibly amending in the zoning ordinance to bring our standards more in line to what we have in the city because it's it's evident especially as far as our density standards that you know over 90 percent of our multiple family sites in the city can't meet our current density standard and the both planning commission and city commission is uh, through their approval of various you know pud and conditional rezonings have been willing to allow projects with higher densities uh, so we have shown a few uh, recommendations as far as things in the ordinance we can look at They're preparing specific language to bring back to you uh, to modify our density standards uh, reduce some of our street parking standards for multiple families and another related uh, uh, standards regarding multiple family dwellings uh, to encourage more of them our standards to be more in line with projects that have been reviewed and approved recently by this board and the city commission as well yeah, the only other one I would add to that is the the height standard we, we haven't really done an analysis of the maximum height but uh, well, that's that's one of the other items that uh, you'll see is if you look through some of the suggested potential revisions that's not really related to density <coughs> or parking but should also be addressed because I think what we're finding with projects is three-story buildings are not going to be able to meet 30 feet. Mm -hmm. um, and again, those provisions all came out of the 1999 master plan, 2001, 2002 zoning ordinance provisions. And this is really the first huge comprehensive look at these things since then. Yeah, prior to that, you know. Prior to that, they were written by a committee and so staff had review input but we didn't really come up with those provisions so we're looking for your input uh, there's some suggestions in there where we could go but uh, I think Dick, Doug, Doug and both Joseph did a good job putting this yeah. together excellent report yes. spent a lot of time and on it, so. work. thank you yeah. I don't know what that means but I echo those <laughs> sentiments nor could you spell it right 
I can't spell anything. There's no spell check coming out of it. Well, unless you have questions, I think we're going to proceed, and it may take some time with uh, uh, revisions to the various zoning sections. Unless you object to us doing that, we'd like to proceed with making some revisions that may include suggesting two multifamily districts, or it may simply make modifications to the ones that currently exist. Uh, but unless you, unless you tell us not to proceed, we're going to proceed with mm -hmm. some suggested revisions. To are, the are you going to include zone. the height as well in those? Yes, the height. Okay. You just have to get mm -hmm. to that one. Okay. Yeah. Ms. Vicky, I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, I, I think this is great work, and I look forward to reading it in, in more depth. Um, one um, thing that strikes me is as we as, as we look at um, having modifications that have uh, lower setbacks. One thing that I'm concerned about, I think, you know, when the original setbacks in Royal Oak, especially in the downtown area, we have to think back that a lot of the space around this area was farmland still. And so obviously old towns with tramways and that kind of things built right up to the sidewalks because it was a very dense walkable area, something that I think we're still striving for. But the one thing I think that is a big contrast today to historical times is we no longer have those forests around us that were there when this town was established in the 1800s. And so in my mind, when we think about the density, I'd like to see the density come more in line as we're discussing and the height come more in line as we're discussing, but that the green space and the setbacks are something that I'd like to see us consider very important for both trees and native plantings and such to offset the much, for much greater human density we have around us because we can't maintain our, our, our air quality and such if we keep building up and having those complete cemented areas. And if you look as you walk around um, various parts of the city, um, there are places where like townhouse developments and, and, and taller buildings, even parking garages do have setbacks and trees by them. And then there are others that don't. And I would advocate very strongly moving forward that we would consider the climate change challenges, the reports that the whole planet should go back to 50% unmodified. Um, areas that are not modified by humans and we start to intersperse um, that green space not not massively but conscientiously as we look uh, go as we go forward so that's the one aspect that I'd really like to have a different idea that that 10 foot setback I think is important those kind of setbacks they don't have to be great giant um, but I'd like that to be considered as you look forward to the next um, phase of this uh, study I'm glad to hear also we do have those places that have almost no parking because, again, that comes from when we had more transit and people walking. Um, and luckily, we have a lot of districts here that people can survive and walk to their stores and stuff, so they don't necessarily have to have a, an automobile. Um, so, but great work. Look forward to reading further. Thank you, Ms. Vicky. Ms. Douglas. Yes, I have several questions. First of all, what is the basis of the formula X thousand square feet for the first two dwelling units plus X thousand square feet for it, each additional unit? Why, why do we use that formula? Well, historically, I guess I'll say that, uh, again, Doug referenced when this ordinance provision was drafted was, uh, it was adopted in 2002, but it was subsequent to the 1999 master plan uh, 2001 uh, ordinance revisions which were revisions to the entire zoning ordinance and since then we've modified a lot of sections but that ordinance was written by a consultant that, that the city hired uh, and worked through a, a task force slash committee uh, so where those came from staff wasn't really privy to other than reviewing that that's what they put in. So they weren't generated from staff, so I, I can't tell you exactly how they came up with them. So what would, is the net effect of this? I mean, if we say 6,000 square feet for the first two dwelling units plus 1,500 square feet for each additional unit, what is the net effect in terms of unit sizes? Well, unit for sizes aren't impacted. This is simply a formula based on how many units you could put on a site. There are different provisions that talk about minimum unit sizes. Elsewhere in the zoning ordinance? Or, um, should, that's not what we were charged with looking at. But isn't that relevant here? Um, we, can, we can give them to you. I don't, I mean, we've got units that 
our studios that are very small. The mix of units has generally been submitted by uh, the various developers, whether they're studio efficiencies, combinations, one or two bedrooms. Unless you want to start dictating what their proposal is, I don't, you know, I mean, if they want to propose an all efficiency like the one on 11 Mile Road, you know, we're not, we haven't been dictating what types of units someone, we've just had minimum standards as what they had to meet if you proposed one. Yeah, there's a section in the ordinance that stipulates a minimum floor area. Uh, based on the type of dwelling unit, be it a single family detached, multiple family, or two family. Are you multiple families based on efficiency of one bedroom, two bedroom, or three bedroom. We do check that with every project that comes through, and I, I just I can't remember one that hasn't met the minimum floor area standard. Uh, Are even you looking for a standard though that would change the lot area based on the unit mix or the unit type is that where your question is no i'm just as i and maybe i'm just not understanding this correctly but when we demand six thousand six thousand square feet for the first two dwelling units plus fifteen hundred square feet after that um we're not making a distinction between what types of units there are but doesn't that result in larger units? Isn't that what we're saying there? Why? No. Okay. Or do you mean it takes up more land space because you have to add the 1,500? Is that? You're saying to reduce it from 8,000 to 6,000. So the 6,000 square feet or not. Yeah. is the footprint? Base. It's, it's the, yeah, it's the area of the site. It's the land mass of the site. Right, I'll have to go back and study on this because I thought I understood this, but I don't think I do. Let me ask some other questions. Um, the, the idea of the 36 feet or the idea of a three-story building, um, it, what we've seen here at the Planning Commission is that a five-story building is more um, uh, economical for a builder or more efficient, why are why do we say three stories? And or will we just allow more stories under a like a site plan review? Well and I, and I think that's where I referred back that that's one thing we haven't really analyzed or studied where we've looked at the others, but where we may come up with two different zoning districts or two different areas where you may want to apply different height requirements or different density requirements or, or, or allowable rather than just carte blanche everywhere across the city because uh, there may be areas where you do want to allow four or five stories without an issue mm -hmm. where other areas you would limit it again to three stories. The problem that I think that occurs is you can't fit a three-story building in a 30-foot height limit. It, so you're constantly dealing with somewhere between four to six feet of additional height uh, on all those those occasions because generally the first floor is taller than the other floors. I agree, and, and we've waived that height limit, I mean, consistently over the past years that I've been here. So I, I totally get that. But yes, I'm very very interested in that more flexible standard and being able to, to build those taller buildings. So part of the analysis will be where... Right. Yeah. Can, can I make one just quick comment regarding that? Um, with regard to those those height, to those taller buildings then and where they might be located in, in, in looking at the different sites, if we think about a transit-oriented development plan, I would think along the Woodward Corridor where you see the fast bus now and some other buses or by this the um, transit station, if we're going to give waivers or, or have new areas that would have higher buildings, I would think along Woodward is an area that you could get a lot of benefit to the community for transit-oriented development um, rather than maybe them always being clustered in the downtown. I'd even looking go forward. I'd even go taller. Even taller. At even, those notes. Yes, yes. So just to put, yeah, thanks. Um, just a question about sort of market forces vis-a-vis -vis unit size and parking demand. I mean, I read about this a lot, and, you know, others here do as well. 
Um, what are we sort of, but Mr. Hedges, Mr. Twain, what are we seeing here? It, are my assumptions correct that demand is uh, increasing for smaller units and that it is true that um, these smaller units and contemporary young buyers don't need two parking spaces or maybe you don't even need one and a half parking spaces? Thoughts on that? Well, I, I think based on the data that, and, and Doug can elaborate too, based on the data we found is, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of the developments that have not had unique type unit mixes have complied with two. They've determined that that's what they need for their unit mix. Mm -hmm. Others have been anywhere from one per unit to 1.3, 1.5, based again on their unit mix and who they think their buyers are going to be. So yes, I would say that's a little market driven on on the. Um, and I I will say that I favor that. That is, I think you know developers know their market and what will sell better than we do. Um, and I'd like to see us stay flexible in terms of our parking requirements. Um, or find a way to tie that to unit size. And my goal here is to get things off the planning commission table. That is, my goal here is administrative approvals as much as possible. So if we can, um, you know, set a standard for parking or conditions for parking that make it easier for staff to make that calculation, I'm in favor of that. Well, and I'll, I'll argue too on top of the market-driven demands, that's for today, when we start looking at the future. Um, the people that have big money on it, you can go to any 10K from any major OEM and you can look at 10 Qs and everything else and find out what their plans are for the different mobility concepts of the future, you know, 10 years out, 15 years out. And the production of the traditional automobile is going to be reduced. I mean, we're not going to see 17 million unit market in North America. Uh, in fact, we're not going to see it next year. It's just going to go down from here, which means less cars, less parking. Yeah. And you know, that's important because not only do they see where the marketplace is going, in a way, ironically, they'll be controlling it based on their output and investment, so. Yeah. So, continuing, sorry, I have a bunch of questions here. Um, I, when we talk about two-family area, uh, uh, zoning districts, um, I'm going to, I would like to see us consider um, allowing two-family structures in all residential zoning districts. And the, the example others have here at this table have heard me say this before, you look at the new homes we're building, these 2,500 square foot, you know, two-story, two-and-a-half story homes. I mean, you see a 2,500 square foot home, I see two 1,200 square foot flats. And I see that I think that there is that, um, as, I mean, especially as I think about senior housing, I mean, I think buildings like that offer an opportunity for maybe a grade entrance and someone with um, physical limitations or someone who's aging, living on the ground floor, and being able to either have their you know, young family live above or rent the unit above. I mean, I think that creates a lot more opportunities for sharing, and I think integrating that into our residential neighborhoods will not have a, a detrimental effect on those residential neighborhoods. If we're going to go down that option, not to conflict with uh, Commissioner Douglas, because I believe in concept, you know, there is a, you know, prudent um, cause to say, hey, look, you know, we have to make housing more affordable in our neighborhoods because I look at even, you know, my parents as they get older, um, you know, having the ability to have, you know, someone else nearby on property that can help take care of an aging population is important. But maybe it's called out, you know, in a in a separate provision where it's not all the same rules as you know a normal multifamily or <coughs> two-family home, where there's a few conditions maybe applied to it that you know help at least try to preserve the single home environment. But you get the benefit of having, you know, um, more affordable and accessible living. As the are the, you looking at at least one of the units to be owner occupied? That would be an interesting provision if it's possible. Um, are you looking for the other unit to be rent rented to a family member or? Um, no, I don't no. think so. Not in that regard, because you could, might want to rent it for a caretaker. You know what I mean? Um, I think that you know we have the largest 
wave of, I mean, Michigan is going to, and I'm not knocking like Florida, but Florida has a very large retiree population. Um, there's a whole lot of needs down there, and Michigan is not too far off here in the next 20, 30 years. Most, a great portion of our population will be, um, you know, hitting their 70s, 80s, 90s. And, you know, but still active, still healthy. We're fortunate to have good health care in the state. And, um, but, you know, people might need to have a grandchild living there or a caretaker um, that can, you know, keep people in their homes uh, as long as possible. Um, and, you know, maybe with some oversight. And I think, you know, creating conditions that allow for that where the caretaker has privacy and everything like that, um, you know, might make sense. I think. You know, the, the, the other issue, I mean, we again, single family, you know, we don't want there to be a, a major land grab in our neighborhoods and have all the single family homes torn down and, you know, because, I mean, that would definitely make financial sense for a lot of developers to come in and do that. So I think having some conditions that really fit in the spirit of what Commissioner Douglas is talking about um, versus in, in trying to avoid maybe, you know, a unintend, unintended profiteering exercise <laughs> Uh, in the fabric of our neighborhoods. Are you uh, talking about um, so the potential to add smaller duplexes on a single family property, something like that, or two tiny homes? Or I'm not talking about accessory dwelling units. Okay. I could, <laughs> we could, but I'm not. I'm talking about two family uh, uh, envelopes. So. Uh, Maybe a duplex on a single family site, a, a, a lot of starting right. to look at allowing those. Yeah, okay. could be side by side, could be stacked. I mean, the current configurations really lend themselves more to stacked mm -hmm. than side by side just because of the nature of our lot sizes, even in our bigger neighborhoods. What about something like um, a small single family home with a um, in law suite or something? Or a detached. Tiny home and back for a, a parent, aging parent, or something like that. You know, something not a shed. No, but, oh, no, <laughs> I, you know, I mean, <laughs> some, I'm just trying to be innovative here in yeah. Royal Oak. I mean, it would be nice to be able to do that if it's, you know, I, I don't know what that looks like. I'm not an architect, but. Yeah. Well, and, and to some extent, we allow not separate. Separate. We allow. There is. There are some provisions in there that I, I don't believe anyone is really taking <laughs> advantage of in the sense of of using a portion of the existing home or or an addition to a home, uh, f primarily for a, a caretaker for the owner occupant or a family member that needs uh, care from a family member. Uh, some of those provisions, and I, I won't remember them all, but they're they're required to record an easement or record a uh, a document at the, the county as a as a lien. So there's a record of it. So when that person moves or dies, it's converted back. Mm -hmm. um, so I, if I understand, I think we could probably look at that section to see what could be modified. I was going there. Yeah. But I, I, I don't, Doug, I don't think I've seen anybody take advantage of what's in that section. Not, a, not for have, over 10 years. It was the last one, I think, was around 2008 or 2009. And I don't think it was ever built, even though they got approval for it. Would someone be allowed to turn a garage into a small home in, in the back? Not under a, what's being proposed here or what the current okay. provisions are. It's okay. got to be part of the main building. Okay. Because I believe there'd even be some potentially, depending on where that accessory building is, there might be some building code issues See, about could, proximity. Of the, you could the build setbacks. like a small apartment within your garage or even over your garage for. Right now, you can. You can. Okay. Do we want to incorporate? I mean, this is a discussion of multifamily housing, right. and and ADUs are a different subject, and maybe we don't want to clutter up our this current discussion with that, but I don't want to let it slide off our agenda because I think it's worthy of consideration. I, I like the discussion. I think it's um, valuable discussion, and you know, it, it doesn't. I mean, why not talk about this? If, you know, maybe there's some sections within Royal Oak that this would fit nicely. I'd like to hear. I'd like yeah. to hear what people think. Yeah. I mean, in social media, you kind of get a little chatter, and there, you know, voices on well, both sides. We should have that conversation. Yeah, with the accessory building, I think it's interesting because you have, 
I mean, in, in this, and people have a whole, I'm not expressing any opinions by saying this because I, I think that it has to be carefully thought out uh, and considered. I do too. But you have, I mean, I've noticed in other communities, like people have art studios and, you know, depending on where they live, mm -hmm. they kind of operate their business. That's their office. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They have, you know, not that they have traffic. They're not, you know, it's still an in-home business, but it's heated and it's got washrooms. It's, That's you just know. one down the street from you, um, that beautiful home on the corner. And they've yeah. got that sort of the outbuilding there. I think it's a, a little business that they have there. Mm -hmm. We proved the sign there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and those are the types of things. I mean, you or it could be for you know guests, or it could be for uh, maybe a kid that's going to college that needs to you know stray a little farther away from the nest, or for an aging parent, or heck, maybe people for bequeath income. their homes to their kids and then they move into the house, or you know what I mean, or you know as retirement portfolios and things happen, maybe you you know rent your house to a nice family and. You know, you don't need as much space anymore, and you move into one of these dwellings. So I think there's definitely great use cases. I think that the traditional arguments, you know, albeit I think are overinflated, I think you still have to look at them as a serious consideration. Like, all of a sudden, if it turns into, I mean, look, I, I guess I, I turned 40, so I can say it now, you know, all those young kids out there partying and moving <laughs> in and all that. Not that I would have any issue. We have some, some great young people that live across the street from us. Uh, but, you know, there is always concern that if, if, you, if you turn... You, know, you create a situation that becomes a little less quiet. Um, is that a, an issue for a lot of our residents? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's something to, to consider. And, and I will say that I, I have a friend who lives in Royal Oak, and they have a, a accessory dwelling unit grandfathered in. And in fact, at one point, um, the mother lived there, said, I'm going to move into the little garage. Daughter, you can live in the main house. Mm -hmm. It's good. We talk about aging in place, it's not building necessarily, you know, 30 story towers for everyone to move into once they right. hit a certain age. Aging in place means you can stay in your neighborhood, stay in your city, but maybe even stay on your own property. Mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. important. I think so. It is for me. I just, I like the idea of Royal Oak being innovative and thoughtful, having these discussions. I think it's worthwhile. Grand Rapids does a, has done a great job with this. Yeah, I bet. They're, they're the cutting edge of just about anything. Yeah. We should be. Any other discussion on this? Do, do you need us to receive or accept this? No, I, I you... didn't hear any objections, so we'll okay. start putting something together. That's okay. going to take a little time, but of course. there's a lot of moving parts. But did you have any follow-up, Doug? No. Nope. Okay. okay, then if nothing else, then, Char, your questions are? Yes. Okay. Then um, if we could move on to item C. Um, this is the marijuana establishments and medical marijuana facilities. Who's taking this one? Uh, well, I'll start out, and, and it probably will involve uh, Doug as well as uh, Dave Gillum from the city attorney standpoint, depending on what your questions might be. Um, you do have... Uh, the staff report in front of you that outlines uh, uh, some very good background on both the medical marijuana facilities and that act as well as the more recent uh, uh, recreational uh, marijuana and the establishments there. Um, and there's quite a bit of background in it um, in the report uh, as well as links to uh, various other items that uh, Hope you've had a chance to at least to uh, go through. Uh, the city commission has talked about this on a couple of occasions, so um, uh, there's a little more that uh, two members may uh, knowledge have than the others that are here. Um, staff also went in and drafted uh, some potential uh, <coughs> zoning ordinance revisions that include definitions. And those are primarily taken from the, uh, the two acts. Um, then we've also given you some options in terms of if you wanted to recommend uh, some type of the facility or establishments in uh, zoning districts. Uh, what we've outlined are primarily the general business uh, zoning district as well as potentially the industrial uh, zoning district. Uh, as potential locations for uh, 
these various types of establishments or facilities. Um, then we've also drafted some potential um, general standards in terms of uh, compliance and prohibited items and submissions and applications. Uh, and those are all uh, part of your packet uh, and very similar. You'll see there's a couple of blanks or questions uh, uh, in there. Um, what we've also done in the report is looked at buffer or setback requirements from both uh, schools, existing school sites. Uh, we also looked at setbacks and buffers if you were to include uh, religious institutions or churches. Um, all of those maps are uh, uh, there in terms of a link. There's a thousand foot buffer from schools. There's a 500 foot buffer from schools. What those all those maps are doing is giving you an indication of where uh, it would be if those were in place. One of those is in place where potential facilities or establishments could locate. Uh, are, are one of those <coughs> currently or both in the law right now? I'm sorry, I don't, don't I haven't read the law, so. Is well, there a and, and provision for buffers from schools. Yeah, and I well, the, the general provision is the city can establish your locational requirements. And, the buffer. Right. Okay. Um, Has the city had discussions about the buffer yet? You said it's been in the commission. Well, the city commission has had a work session and they had a brief conversation last night, but there's been no direction procedurally. Zoning ordinance amendments are going to start here. Okay. And these, again, are drafts and staffs looking for your discussion and your direction on how you want us to proceed with various items uh, before you schedule a public hearing for input from the general public. Um, so what we're trying to do is give you some ideas and background and, and start that discussion um, with some knowledge base of what different setbacks or buffers from things would do. Mm -hmm. um, the report obviously talks about how many properties potentially would be eligible depending on which buffer or distance was imposed. It also talks a little bit about if you imposed a buffer between facilities, meaning if there's already a, a, a marijuana establishment at one site, how far away does the next one have to be from that site? So there's some discussion in the report about that. Obviously, depending on where the first one gets located, if there's one located, it impacts the potential for where the next one would occur. Um, so the report goes through all those items. It also references a, a question in the sense of there are two general business properties on North Main, right near 11 Mile Road that the staff's asking that you at least consider whether you wanted to rezone to those to neighborhood business to preclude those locations from potential uh, establishment. If you do, we would have to start that process as well. Um, I think with that, I don't know, Doug, do you want to say anything? Or Dave, do you want to give any overview of... No, I mean, I think the memo covered it pretty well. And in terms of your question, um, the the MRTMA, the uh, Adult Use uh, Act, provides that uh, the default is going to be a thousand foot distance from a school, okay. um, and then the community has the ability to set a lesser setback or buffer if you if you want. Or more, it, right? It can't be more than no more. A, no more than okay. a thousand. No, okay. it can be less, or you can leave it at a thousand. Okay, so, thank you. But there is no That's specific schools. requirement. That's for schools. There is nothing specific in the act relative to, to churches or religious establishments. Okay. So. And that's what we tried to spell out with the links in the report to show how many properties would be affected depending on if we apply the thousand foot buffer or if it's reduced to five hundred feet. Uh, to show how many properties in the zoning districts were discussed would still be eligible uh, for for uh, marijuana business to be established. Is there a definition districts. of school? The Act, I K believe, through, spells out. 12? The Act, I believe, spells out that it's K through twelve. Correct. Equivalent. Private or public. 
existing in, in existing also. <clears throat> okay. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Um, is is there any? Oh oh, oh I'm sorry. No, that's what I'm asking. Sure, Ms. Vicky. I don't know if we're in discussion or we're. Um, was there anything? Is there anything in any of the um, uh, either legislation or what we're considering um, regarding setbacks from parks, public parks, from parks? Yeah. No, we we, we looked at that. Uh, we haven't suggested that. I think that would pretty much eliminate every site in town. Because we have so many. Because mm -hmm. we have so many parks. Oh, okay. So yeah, we did. We did. <laughs> we did look at and you know calculate applying that setback to public <laughs> parks, and it does of the. Zoning districts we're discussing it eliminates practically all of them. Yeah. Uh, the same with a setback from residential zoning. Uh, there's, yeah, if you apply that standard, then we have, I think, two or three properties that can meet the setback. So that's why we did not, in the draft language, include a setback from either of those. So I'm just going to rephrase that. We have amazing, thriving neighborhoods and a large number of parks in here that contribute to the high quality of life we enjoy in Royal Oak. Absolutely. absolutely. Can, I, can I ask another question? Please. Just, and also just so I'm understanding, because um, I haven't been involved in the other discussions that the, the City Commission members have. Um, I'm concerned in general about smoking in public, whether it's a cigarette or marijuana. With this ordinances and the marijuana distribution, so that the vending places, are they going to have inside smoking so that the smoking is inside? I, I previously lived in Colorado, and so I'm familiar with that, that that was indoor. Is that how this is set up, or is this simply dispensing, and then where are people actually smoking? I may have to defer to Mr. Gillum on that, but I believe that the only license type under the state laws that allows uh, indoor smoking or consumption are the designated consumption establishments. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't believe you're allowed to either smoke or consume it in any of the other license types. So that's, people are meant to smoke correct. on the street then, or are they supposed to be meant to smoke in their homes? <clears throat> you're not allowed to consume in public either. Okay. So that's a civil infraction. You get a ticket if you do that. So, And actually, um, the designated consumption establishments, my interpretation of the act, that is not something that the city is required to provide for either. So, right. um, that, um, I know uh, the mayor and and Shar have heard this uh, this rant before. But um, under the MRTMA, if you opt in, um, you you have to allow any of the six different license types. You can't pick and choose which ones you want to have and which ones you don't want to have. With medical marijuana, you can be more selective. But with the adult use, you cannot be selective. Um, but there are some other kinds of licenses that weren't created by the statute, but were created by the administrative rules that have been promulgated by the state. And my interpretation of the act is that the three types of licenses that are provided for in the rules, one of those being the designated consumption establishment, those are purely optional. The city does not have to provide for those. Okay. So we don't have to provide any kind of a facility anywhere in the city for the consumption of marijuana if the city doesn't want to. Okay. People would, of course, then be free to consume in their own um, homes. I mean, we've, we've been made aware of it. We've talked about it. Um, but that's not, we haven't made any decisions on any of that yet. Uh, what we're trying to do is, and I understand it's kind of part and parcel with what's going to occur, therefore, that would affect our decision on the planning <laughs> of what, how things should be zoned and permitted. Um, but no, we haven't progressed to that point yet. Okay. Well, again, can, oh, sorry, can I? Yes, oh, please, yeah. so, so, I mean, again, because, because this is at the study level, and again, we're going to be considering various zoning and ordinance issues, um, if I can, and recently when I was in Japan, just it's interesting some cities, or actually not even the whole city, some neighborhoods have decided, for example, just even with cigarette smoke, to, to restrict it to back being inside spaces so it's not on the street. So both inside a bar they'll have a sealed room or a coffee place, and likewise on the street there's a sealed place. And again, I'm hearing that marijuana, you can't, you're not supposed to smoke in public in the first place. Although um, the act doesn't define a public place either. Oh, see, so, so this is tricky. Yeah. So, so again, thinking if we're going to be looking at zoning and ordinances, even thinking about cigarette smoke, is that something uh, 
that at a city level we can restrict its place, or is that is this, this? I know it's been for many years that obviously people smoke outside of buildings. Is that something that the state stipulates for all communities, or can communities have different kinds of restrictions? Like when I lived in Colorado, some people said you couldn't smoke on certain streets, for example. Do you know? Maybe that's not for this discussion. Yeah. I can. I think that's a different. I'll send issue. you an email. Yeah, I'm just. Not, I'm not aware of any communities around here. That have put specific that have restrictions that. on smoking. No. Okay, fair enough. I was just wondering about this related to the marijuana specifically, but it, to me, the cigarette smoke is just as much of a nuisance personally. So but the the smoking of marijuana is not allowed in a public space, but public space wasn't defined. Right. But so public spaces are defined in the city within the city limits, aren't they? Well, <clears throat> there are other statutes that do define public places. Well, what's what's considered to be a public place? So I think probably what we'll end up doing is looking to pick up one of those other definitions, okay. maybe in regards to tobacco products or something like that, and plug that definition of what is a public place into our ordinances for purposes of marijuana as well. Okay. Got a question? Yes. Yeah. So I, I see from our responsibility here, I mean, there's a lot of balls that are moving right now, and there's a lot of interplay, like what we talked about. Mr. Gillen brought to our attention, like, hey, you're going to have to talk about zoning, you're going to have to talk about licensing, and then we're going to have to talk about sort of, uh, I wrote it down as court administrative ordinances that may affect some, like the definition of what a public place is. Like, that's a good example of maybe something that's outside licensing and zoning. Um, yeah, if, I, if I could just to, to, to um, expand on that a little bit, um, the act is specific. There are certain things that you can't do one of them being consume marijuana in public. And so that will be a violation of state law to do that. We can also make that a violation of local ordinance, so which I think we would want to do just for the same reason we make many other offenses that are a violation of state law, a violation of local ordinance, so the Royal Oak Police Department can go ahead and write somebody a ticket right. as opposed to having to, to charge them under state law. So, okay. so that would be the third prong is basically – Amendments to our existing criminal criminal or, well it wouldn't be it would be a civil infraction but to an amendment to our existing offenses ordinance. So, and and I think we said well let's start with kind of the zoning like where should you know just from a logical point of view there's a new business concept out there where should this business operate you know and knowing like Mr. Gillum said if you uh, you know permit one. You have to permit all the models, with the exception of the two that were added after with the consumption, and I can't remember, the on-site consumption events. and special events. So and also the, the, the excess grower, which is a, a large, right. very large marijuana operation. So what we're really looking at is really, okay, let's kind of focus on the traditional model here, in my opinion, as a planning commission. Okay, not, I mean, the city commission has to make decisions on those other two special events and the... Um, on-site consumption and then the mega grower, whatever we want to call it, but the ones that are really within the framework of the basic legality, um, where does it make sense, um, you know, where should it deviate, in my opinion, from, you know, a normal business or a like business, or do we parallel it to anything? We have a few levers here, obviously from a zoning perspective, we have the, you know, types of zoning, is it, should it be, you know, restricted only to the general um, industrial and, and general business? Um, should it be allowed in neighborhood business? Should it be, should there be certain geographies that we kind of rezone that were mentioned? Um, and then of course we have this other lever that um, is with, you know, feet from schools. Is it 500? Is it a thousand? And what are we trying to achieve with it? I guess, you know, in that discussion, um, you know, these levers to me don't seem static. I think over a hundred years, you know, Planning commissions and commissions down the road will have to adopt to changing consumer behaviors. What is the process or how committed are we if we come out and we say, oh, well, I feel good with 500. Maybe 10 years from now we want to say, oh, 100 feet. I mean, these things can be changed. Or is it, you know, maybe walk us through that process and what sort of trouble we can find ourselves in if we, you know, pick something and then we want to, maybe we pick 500, but then we realize it's chaos can't predict anything, let's just say that's the case, and then we want to raise it to a thousand or vice versa. We put it at a thousand, we feel comfortable. We got we had the first few come through, we know what we're doing, 
and then maybe we want to lower it to 500. What are the maybe just opinion of staff, some of the does, things we should consider? Does zoning ordinance amendments can occur at any point in time that both the Planning Commission and City Commission enact a new provision? Um, I guess from a perspective, if you're worried about going slowly, you'd probably want to impose the 1,000-foot distance requirement, limit how many are going to be able to uh, initially be established, and then if you felt like you wanted more, you could reduce that buffer area rather than going less and trying to go higher because any one that's already established within the 500-foot zone of each other is now got, not going to meet the 1,000-foot. Mm -hmm. well, you're not going to get rid of them um, because zoning has a grandfather. your grandfather, your nonconforming mm -hmm. provisions, so you would couldn't shut them down from a zoning standpoint. Um, you know, I don't know what licensing provisions you'd put in to address that, but if you wanted to take small steps, you would impose larger restrictions and and go that direction and lessen them as you. But either way, there's flexibility in the system. If you go down, there's less headaches. If you go up, you just have the non-conforming properties, and you just have to acknowledge that. I think you'd have more trouble going that direction. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And then I guess one of the decisions that I suppose we'll have to make is in terms of the, the licensing regulations, do we just want to reference the zoning ordinance requirements? Do we want to make compliance with zoning ordinance requirements um, one of the, the standards for the issuance of a license? Or do we want to have specific standards in our licensing ordinance in and of itself in addition to the zoning ordinance requirements. So, I mean, arguably, you, you could you could argue that it's belt and suspenders that you don't need to do both. That you don't need to say in your licensing ordinance that in order to be eligible for a license, your establishment can't be <clears throat> within a 1,000 feet of a public or private school. But um, if you did that, then the, the, the benefit to the city would be if you decided that you wanted to change it down the road you don't have to deal with the issue of a non-conforming use. The regulatory ordinance, you can change that. If you have someone that has a license that's existing, um, then you can argue whether or not they have a vested right to continue for the term of that license. But it's not a perpetual or long-standing non-conforming use. Well, and there are probably, probably operational things that you would put in a licensing ordinance that you would not put in a zoning ordinance, you know, like hours of operation or, right. you know, things like that. You may want to put in a license so you can adjust them easier or, yeah. or deal with. So more of the operational stuff I would see going in there. Uh, we did touch a little bit on in, in our commentary to you about temporary marijuana events and that that would not be part of the zoning ordinance. The zoning ordinance doesn't allow any temporary activities. Right. All of those are dealt with through other other ordinance provisions so we did suggest that. Um, and then some of the other licenses are issued to individuals to do various things like special transporters and and the event organizer. Those are not going to be land use zoning issues. Um, so. Is the license through the city and the state or just the city? If they're, if they're licensed to have an establishment, do they have to be licensed <coughs> through the state of Michigan? Well, I think what we're talking about really is both. You're going to have to have a state license okay. in order to get a city license. Okay. And there's a pre-qualification process at the state and we would, what we've talked about it with the commission level is requiring the pre-qualification and meeting the initial standards for eligibility at the state level before you can come to the city okay. and make your city application. So it's vetted there and then, okay. Yeah, and we believe that'll save Yeah, they can't a lot issue a state time. license, though, unless they have a local approval. Oh, okay. So if the city opted out, then you, you couldn't get a license okay. to operate here. Right. And some and many they need cities a, they are. They need a locational now. item right. to get finalized okay. in the state. Are there any cities around us that have opted out? 
Um, I think there are, there are probably more that have opted out at this point than have opted in. Right around us, though? I mean, Clawson, Berkeley, Oak Park, where, where are they in? The Madison Heights is in. Um, I believe Hazel Park is in. Ferndale is in. Uh, Birmingham um, is out. Um, a lot of the communities on the west side of the county are out. Farmington, Farmington Hills, Novi. They're out? They're out, okay. yeah. Technically, we're out. Yeah. Yeah, Peter, a lot of communities have, I mean, they've opted out because they want to opt out, but some have opted out just to say, hey, let's Push figure this out button. and, you know, do it the right way so we can be fair and equitable to everybody who has a stake in this. Okay. And that, that's absolutely correct, yeah. And there are some other communities around that um, the way the act is set up for the adult use marijuana, if um, there's, a, there's a right to referendum, and there are some communities that have gone through the referendum process, and at least recently, anyway, based upon the media reports I've seen, it's kind of interesting, but most of the communities that have gone through the referendum process, which is started by advocates, by people who want the community in, the, the residents of the communities are voting not to get in, they're voting out. <laughs> it's a great irony. So that's well. what happened down in uh, Highland Park, and uh, there are a couple other communities in, in outstate Michigan recently that, that this happened as well. So. A question. Yes, Ms. Beagie. Do we have uh, again? Uh, do we have any medical marijuana uh, unit places here? Because I know that passed earlier, right? We do not. Uh, medical marijuana is you have to opt in for that. That's an opt in, and it, up to this point in time, the city commission has chosen not to opt in. Oh, so even in previous years. Yeah. yeah, yeah okay. So there are no medical marijuana legal medical marijuana facilities in the city of Rome. Okay. Okay. Like a, a commercial, like a building, but the, aren't there some private, like uh, pr private dwellings that? Well, the neither the the um, the medical marijuana facilities act or the, the the recreation the adult use act, neither one of those affect um, all the rights that were vested upon individuals under the original medical marijuana act. Okay. So for patients and caregivers and their ability to possess and grow, manufacture. Um, they still can do that. They can still do all that. Okay. That, that hasn't changed at all. But there's just not a storefront no with a sign facility. that says, okay. come on in and get your medical marijuana. Correct. Center okay. whatever. Yeah. So Again, we're looking for a little bit of direction on how you want to proceed. Uh, technically, again, we would have to schedule it for any sort of public hearing if you wanted to consider an amendment to the zoning ordinance. If you don't, then there's no need to schedule a public hearing. Um, you know, we've given some options, some language, some commentary. I, and there's no rush. If you want to talk about it more next month, we can. Uh, the only deadline I think we're up against is the sunset the commission put in in February uh, for the opt-out. 2020. Of 2020, uh, and they could extend that. So there's not a there's not a rush to deal with this if you have more questions. But uh, our next step would be to uh, kind of pare the provisions down, put some uh, language in as to whether or not you wanted to go with a thousand feet, whether you wanted separation from facilities, which facilities you may want to consider in general business or industrial, uh, and do you want to rezone a couple of the, the general business sites so that they're not eligible. Um, those sorts of things we would look for direction on and uh, how to proceed before we do the public hearing. And I can't speak for the for the mayor and the mayor pro tem, but <clears throat> the discussion at the city commission table has been that um, either either the city commission or the planning commission here, if um, if either body needs more time to study the issues and come to the right decision, I think the commission has indicated they'd be willing to consider extending the date on the opt out. Um, they want to move forward as quickly as we can. Um, I think the, the intent behind the original uh, sunset date was to make sure that the staff and the appropriate boards and commissions were moving forward with the study of the issues and working towards the right decision. Uh, there was just a concern that 
there would be no action or because we've got an election year coming up that maybe there would be no action until after the election or maybe even longer than that. So the idea was to, to keep the process moving. But again, the comments at the commission table have been if the city needs more time, we can get more time. But we just want to keep the process moving. Okay, uh, Ms. Douglas. So I, I obviously the mayor and I have had more time to, to think this over than the rest of the commissioners, and I, I do feel like we have three sevenths of our members not here, and I'm yes. I'm very reluctant to, to do anything without their input, and I guess I would ask them to please watch the video of this meeting so we don't have to rehash everything that we've just uh, the background that we've just gone over. Um, but I'm, I'm going to hazard my own opinion that, well, first of all, we need to rezone those properties on Main Street north of 11 Mile, for sure, um, those three sites. Um, but I, So I drove up Woodward today, kind of looking at the you know, properties along Woodward, since really that's where most of the general business zoning is. Um, and it strikes me that the very nature uh, or the very existence of the established businesses along Woodward is going to naturally reduce the opportunities for any sorts of um, establishments there. Re re and I'm talking about either stores or micro businesses. Um, and the lack of parking is further going to restrict their capacity. Um, and it's going to drive up their real estate prices because in order to put together the parking that they may need for these establishments, you know, they may need to invest in buying stores and tearing them down to add parking. So I, I, sort, of think, I, I sort of think that the idea of a, of a big setback between marijuana businesses, and we saw in the, the numbers here that when we do that, it reduces the number to um, 11 general business sites that would be eligible for um, uh, these marijuana establishments. And of those 11, what are the odds that any of them are for sale or available or suitable? So I'm, I'm inclined to let the zoning be the laissez-faire, uh, uh, the nature of the existing businesses be sort of the laissez-faire way of limiting the number of establishments that we wind up with. Um, if that's Ms. Beaky is frowning on. No, no. I, I mean, I'm new to this topic in terms of in royal. I mean, I'm, not, I'm aware of it going on, but I'm new to the the issues and in, in those kinds of uh, discussions in terms of where things could be or not be. Um, and so I'm just thinking that I would like an opportunity to study this further and get sure. caught up a bit. Maybe I'll watch the commission meetings, too, where you've discussed it so I can get caught up on that. I realized I started watching yesterday, so I know that was one of them as well. You fall asleep halfway through. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, no. <laughs> I had to come here, so I had to stop. Um, so, so I'm not familiar with this discussion you're talking about, but existing spaces and such. I guess my uh, personal immediate reaction would be to think about the the distances and some of the licensing things you've been talking about so that we have, I would like good guidance, I get maybe less laissez-faire, but good guidance on what we would like to see in the institutions. And again, I personally am most concerned about the actual smoking, where the smoke is going, and that I wouldn't want it to be, I've lived in buildings where it's coming through the vents, like that, this is more <laughs> of a concern for me. So this idea like in an industrial zone where people can go in there and smoke, so they're not smoking in the streets. Nobody's, it's not even on the table. Nobody's I know. smoking anywhere in any of these businesses. I, I hope. I, I hope so. But then, well, then they won't have to stay long either if they're just shopping. So right. I don't know about the parking issues. Um, anyway, so that's all. I just need to get caught up on some of the topics and would like maybe to put it on the agenda next time as well. I, oh, I think we should. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I, this is you know important topic, and I think we need to get it right. Yeah, yeah, I agree that I think we need to have a full commission here. I think the members that are missing here tonight all bring a unique perspective. They all have different backgrounds, uh, different experience sets, um, and the more we can involve in this conversation, the better solution we'll have. As it relates to some of the questions that always come with, well, how many should we have and not have and, and all of that, I think my mind is I don't know what the right answer is, um, but I do know this is a brand new concept. With a brand new concept comes uncertainty, and I think we have to manage that a little bit more. I think as a city, um, you know, we have a lot of great things going for us right now. I think other communities, uh, certainly this would be a tremendous economic stimulus for them. 
I think for us, we have to be, we already have some issues in the downtown, let's say, in some other areas where, you know, rents might be artificially high and speculation of, um, you know, let's say liquor licenses or things like that. And uh, I just want to make sure that we're intelligent where, um, you know, we have the right things to make sure that all of a sudden we don't have this gold rush and everybody comes to Royal Oak and then we Sorry. go into a recession and then all these properties have been tied up for, you know, speculative or and or real um, uh, marijuana establishments, which might not be bad in concept, but from an economic perspective, if not all of them survive and then we have a huge exodus during a recession, then we have empty storefronts and empty, you know, and that to me is my main concern, not necessarily restricting the number because, you know, there, I mean, to me, I think it's the state overwhelmingly voted for it. Our neighbors are doing it. You know, the discussion about, you know, access and all of that for the youth and, you know, all these other things, it's a foregone conclusion because of what's happening around us. Mm. But as far as our real estate, you know, Royal Oak is a very attractive place. We get a lot of investment. We've had over a quarter billion dollars worth of commercial investment in the last number of years. Um, I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, when there is things, businesses like stores and everything that's happened over decades and centuries, this is going to be all of a sudden at once, and we want to make sure that we don't have a complete influx and then complete exodus, and then, mm. you know, we don't have the local hardware store anymore. We don't have this because everyone left at once. So, um I just want to make sure we're cognizant of that in our zoning. Do you need any action from us? It sounds like we want no, to... No, I heard you want to have okay. it on next meeting with everybody else here. Okay. That's kind of what I heard, so I'm good with that. If you've got any other questions in the interim, send them along. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and, um, and, and oh, Ann and Ann, I was, just, I was going to say the same thing that Tim just said, too, and this goes for... Uh, Gary and Dan and Eric, when when they're going through this, the the memo that the that, that Tim and Doug put together on it's a great memo. There's an awful lot of information contained yes. in that memo. But as you go through that and you look at that, there are questions that are going to come up. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, if there are questions that uh, that you want to get some input from me on, feel free to reach out to me. Give me a call. Okay. Send me an email, whatever. So. Is the link to the law? That was passed on the memo? Okay. I'm sorry. It was a big memo, and I, I don't... Second paragraph. Oh. Okay. Thank you. That's the, late, the latest one that was adopted last okay. year, MRTMA. Okay. okay. Thank you. Can I ask one yeah. last question? Speaking. Last question. And I think I know the answer. I just want to ask it out loud. What, what is our, uh, our, our ability to have a local tax on the sales in our... Does, is there any potential revenue source... Well, or just like low alcohol, state blocks it, and income ta or state ta or sales tax, we can't. I mean, there are provisions in in the in the state act for if if the city does decide to to opt in on the adult use, then um, there's going to be some some uh, it's probably not the right word for it, but some revenue sharing. Some mm -hmm. of the tax proceeds that are set up will be distributed to the city based upon the number of but establishments indirect. that we have. But it's indirect. Okay. In terms of our ability to establish a city tax per se, we have absolutely no authority to do that. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, let's close that discussion and move on to the administrative site plan approvals. Mr. Twing, is there anything? That's simply informational. Okay. Um, staff just give you a list of what's yep. come through Appreciate office and, and approved. So. Okay, any questions on these? appreciate the, the fine work you guys have done. A lot of beefy memos that we had <laughs> well, to go through. I say Doug and Joe and everybody's spent a lot of time on stuff, so they've done a good job. Okay. It. If nothing else, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Board? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned. <laughs>